everyone. Welcome to Macro Chat Live. We are here with Dom Kamarechka. Did I say it right, Kamarechka? I did. Yeah! <laughs> I am so happy you're here, Dawn. It is such a pleasure to have you. And we have so much to talk about. I have to let you all know, I will check the chats as we are rolling. But Don has a meeting, so Janice will be on top of it. We will make sure that he can go to his meeting. He's like back to back to back to back. So, But Don has said yes to coming to Macro Chat Live Show. Macro Chat Live Show is a show for you people that love close-up, macro, and micro photography. And that's where we talk here and chat all about the awesome stuff. We have critiques, we have, actually we don't have a critique today, Dawn, we have a short. I just wanted to get you in and talk about everything about you. But we do, we are gonna talk about Dawn's equipment a little bit, we're gonna talk about him, we're gonna get really deep dive into macro and his fun, amazing, beautiful work. If you are interested in actually putting in an image for critique, you can go to sullivanjphotography.com. Macro Live is here, and you can submit your images and actually see all of the shows that are previously, and you can ask questions there, and we will make sure everything is on the show for you. So with that said, I'm going to do a real quick uh with my sponsor and then we're going to dive deep into Don and what he does and how awesome he is because he loves to teach which is really cool and he doesn't know everything I'm going to share. <laughs> I, I told him a couple things but I want to make sure that uh, Don is uh, very well shown on all the variety of things that he does. So let me real quickly go to my sponsor and make sure that it's here because I don't even see it. So maybe we won't even do that. Oh yes, here it is. Hold on one second. We will be right back. Today's macro photography live chat show is brought to you by Adventurers of the F-Stop, a $29 monthly membership to elevate your macro and landscape photography and business skills. Just go to membership.sullivanjphotography.com and check out all the details to push your creations in 2018. Hello. You know what, Don? I already have someone popping up saying, Jen, I'm so excited about this. I am a big fan. Heck yeah, I'm a big fan of Don's too. He is amazing. So we are going to share a lot of fun stuff. We're going to talk about uh, basically what, how he got into photography in general. You know, you know, Don, I wanted to ask you these questions because uh, we all have reasons for getting into photography, and I was really curious on why or how you got into photography. It doesn't even have to be macro. Right. Well, I mean, my interest in photography, as you can probably tell by a lot of my work, um, is somewhat scientific or exploratory. It's a way that I can see the world differently with a camera. And uh, when I was young, uh, as, a, uh, as a young boy, you know, jumping in mud puddles and, and all that sort of stuff. I was always very curious about how the world worked in science and never really science minded for math, but I always wanted to figure stuff out. And, uh, and so that I think applies quite strongly in, in the reason why I enjoy photography so much. I like to tinker, I like to explore and photography becomes an outlet for that. Um, but when I was uh, at that same young age, I had absolutely no interest whatsoever in photography in general. It only came in uh, much later when I was uh, talking with my dad, who when he was younger was very much into photography. In high school, he was on the yearbook uh, committee and you know, uh, always in the dark room. And later on, I found out that uh, that's, uh, you know, his reason for that was it was a great place to make out with girls because nobody's <laughs> gonna open the door on you. Um, and so thanks for that, dad. Uh, <laughs> I but, love it. Yeah. And, and so, we had some fun discussions about it, but um, I, I, I don't want to go too deeply into it, but my father <laughs> passed away about 10 years ago, and he, uh, uh, when he was getting sick, uh, there was a long-term illness, and we saw it coming, and uh, at one point, he gave me an envelope that had $1,000 in it, and he said, it's pretty much all that he could give me from his life, uh, so that, you know, go buy anything that you want so that I could see you enjoy it. 
and my parents had divorced and my dad was living mm -hmm. in a city three hours away from me. And so I was looking for ways for us to connect. And so I went out and I bought my first camera. Uh, and we, you know, quickly started to bond over that. And uh, he taught me everything that he knew. And soon after, I was starting to teach him stuff. And we had some great discussions about uh, perceptions and reality and psychology and all of this relating to photography in general. Uh, and it opened my eyes to something really special. When he passed on, there was a small amount of life insurance money that I used to pay off my student debts and buy a slightly better camera. Uh, I'm formally educated in advertising and I suppose that's a type of visual communication in many ways as well. Um, and I worked there for a year as I was building up my photographic career, also working part time at a camera store until I realized I had an opportunity um, where I was still living with my mom. I had a year basically that if I wanted to dive deep into photography and spend 100 hour weeks making no money to build up a brand and a portfolio and all the skills and techniques that I needed, um, I have that year right now. And if I can't make a go of it, I can't make a go of it. But, um, you know, history, uh, you know, it can kind of continue on from there as, as you see me having this conversation with you. It was a successful year, uh, or at least the start of, uh, of a successful career. And I'm so honored to uh, to be able to do what I do. I, I don't take it for granted that I'm a photographer, that my career is macro and uh, infrared and all of these unusual things, uh, and I can pay the bills with that. That's not a common thing, and uh, it did not come easily. There was a long road to get to this point, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, you know, that's really good for you to let everybody know because I think a lot of photographers or people that want to get in photography think it's like this glamorous thing and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to take photos. I'm going to make millions of dollars. And, you know, it's really about your passions. And, and uh, then as you keep going at it, it will come to you. But it is hard work. Business is hard. I mean, that's one of the things I am a businesswoman for sure. And I understand that completely. But yes, and we will share your work. And understandably, people have already said that they know you. I respect you because you are very educated. You work your butt off. And these images were not just snapshots. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to share your website as we talk. And I going to um here's don's website i'm going to go back and forth between don and his website so don i don and i are talking about it he actually has a podcast which we will talk about in a little bit later in the show but uh this will actually be a podcast too we're i'm eventually going to get that going i'm in the works with that and I've had people actually tell me that they rather have they they can't actually see what what's going on so podcasts are good and that's why it's good that you have a podcast too because I think people are going that way they just want to listen to things as they're as they're running uh you know or whatever exercise and doing their home stuff so we would I don't know if you can see what I I don't know if you're on any of uh, we're on Facebook uh we're on YouTube and we're on Twitch so we have a 30 to 30 second delay so some of that will when the questions come in they may be a little bit delayed but people are still seeing your main website at the moment so what i wanted to ask as i go through some of your images is when you're photographing do you have a thought process while you're photographing or do you have a vision prior i want to poke your brain on how you get these beautiful pieces that people are looking at at the moment a lot of it uh, starts with an idea uh, and that idea i know uh you know almost without question will not work uh, at least not in its initial form you know, the, the concept needs to evolve and that's part of the process so mm -hmm. For every successful image that I've got, it probably evolves as uh, you know three or four or five different stepping stones as ideas towards whatever that finished concept is going to be. Sometimes that happens over a, a day, like a you know, four or five hour session of just tinkering. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might happen over months, where whenever I sit down in my studio and try to you know flesh out an idea, uh, I get five more ideas. And oftentimes, some of them are so good that I forget about the idea that I was already working on, and I kind of pinball myself around to all of these different concepts um it's that 
that part of that process, the uh, the journey, not the destination, that I revel in. That that is to me the joy and the passion of all of this is to figure that stuff out. If you're not thinking about photography, specifically macro photography, from that from that perspective, you will give up in frustration far before you're going to get what you're after. Because if you're only after that perfect image and you find the process of creating it a roadblock and you're going backwards, the finished image is to me, it, it's interesting and, and wonderful and I love to share it. But when I'm sharing the image, you'll also know that I share the entire process for which, I w for which it was created uh, or all of the interesting science about the subject that I'm photographing. Everything that I could figure out along the way becomes part of the narrative. And uh, I, I think that kind of answers the question, but it's sitting down and thinking, okay, what if, what if I try this and, and come up with the answer? Whatever the answer is, it's a success. Uh, it's usually a bad photograph. Nine times out of 10, that first uh, attempt at something, it's just an information gathering process and you've got to treat it as such. And as I was sharing your website, I love the narrative that you put next to the pieces. So if any of you guys, I'm going to be sharing Don's links and all his stuff later on after the show, because I was telling Don, I know you, my European friends, I'm so sorry. It's two o'clock in the morning for them, but um, they will be able to come back to the show and check it out. So I was sharing Don's information and he, I love that you have all that down because it brings us to your feelings of what you're doing. Uh, what I'm going to share next though, which I really love is a couple of goodies. Uh, there's a weevil and that is, I believe, is that your ultraviolet stuff that you've been doing now? Well, I've done weevils in a number of ways. Uh, I did one kind of peering over the petal of a daisy, that's, and that was done in ultraviolet. That's the one I that I chose. <laughs> yeah, and so I was out walking my daughter, uh, and I just saw a nice daisy, and she likes to you know pick apart flowers and whatever uh, as something to keep her calm on our walk. So I picked this one, and it's got a weevil kind of floating about on it. So it's, you know what, let's just hold on to that one, give a different one to my daughter, and see if that weevil plays nice until we get home. And he did. Uh, my daughter fell asleep on the walk, so I had a brief window of time for me to set that up in studio and uh, and start to experiment. Ultraviolet fluorescence has been one of those things in the last year that I've really discovered uh, is sort of the, an untouched gem of macro photography. Very few people have, have explored this. I'm not the first, but there's only a handful that have done it well. Um, and the challenges are huge. You never have enough light. Um, you don't know what your subject is going to do until you see the finished image because some images or some subjects are just bland and boring. Uh, and there's a lot of trial and error in that. And then all of a sudden you come across something like a, uh, you know, a Christmas rose or a daisy and a weevil where that weevil was entirely black, but all of oh. the hairs are glowing much brighter than uh, than the shell and, and everything else. And the eyes mm -hmm. of most insects tend to glow an unusual shade of blue. And I still haven't figured out exactly why that is. Those eyes were black. Um, it's a discovery process. And so the finished image is part of that discovery for me. Um, again, that's why I got into photography to begin with. And all of these areas of macro, especially ultraviolet fluorescence, just, you know, uh, tickle that, that part of my soul in a wonderful way. Oh, yeah. It is, I can, you, wait till you see what I'm going to do. Do you know, do you know what this is? Okay, wait. Oh, that, that looks like a, a VR headset of sorts. Yes. Yeah. So I have a feeling you're going to probably know what I'm going to be talking about next, right? Right. <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to revive a mostly dead art form. 
Oh, I let me get over to the screen because I don't even. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Because I'm always screwing up something. Okay, Dawn has done something so cool, everyone. So if you have these things, okay, you got to go to his website. He's doing this 3D stuff. And, you know, I mean, it's not stuff. It's amazing, Don. I When I put, you put your phone, what I did was I put my phone, I got on your website. I put the phone in here. It's like, a, like Don said. And, oh my gosh, the image is so beautiful. 3D. Of course, I did the iris because iris is my favorite my mom we were talking you were talking to we had a little pre-talk and my mom also my mom had passed away she was very special to me irises are her name was iris and iris so when i saw i don't even know if that really is iris you know they all kind of look the same some of them are irises but you have the uh what i forget it's what a, it's a praying mantis nymph. praying mantis it was so cool, Don, that you could see it 3D. So tell me, how are you doing these things? This is so incredible to me. Yeah, and, and well, 3D photography, first of all, has existed for a very long time. I've got a, a camera sitting on my desk here, um, and this is a 3D camera that uh, takes, uh, you look through the center lens, you take pictures with the two lenses on the side, oh. and this is from 1926. Oh my gosh, so, that's amazing. I didn't uh, know that. And, and I, I've got a stereoscope, which is an antique version of that VR headset from 1867. So this has been around for as long as photography. In fact, even before photography, people were drawing in 3D, if you could believe it or not. But uh, today, you have to have like a VR headset or some way to see it uh, appropriately. And it makes it a very, very small audience. So mm. uh, there's not many people that are exploring it. And there's a couple of tricky things to get good results out of it. But the gear doesn't have to be that, uh, that tricky. I was just... Uh, experimenting with this lens from Panasonic, the 12.5 uh, millimeter f12 3D lens for their Micro Four Thirds cameras, um, and effectively what this is is it's two small little lenses inside the same lens barrel, uh, each recording a slightly different perspective of the subject, and the sensor is then divided in half. So the left half becomes, uh, you know, uh, one eye; the right half, uh, half becomes the other eye. Yep. And I have uh, more uh, advanced lenses uh, made by a company in the Netherlands that uh, unfortunately don't manufacture them anymore, uh, mm -hmm. called DeWidges, if I can pronounce that correctly. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've been able to procure three of these at different magnifications to, to put them on my, uh, my Canon camera body. And uh, that's where the challenges really begin, because these have fixed apertures. The Panasonic one is F12. That's pretty pretty wide open yeah um, the smallest one gets down to f80 f80 so the viewfinder is mostly dark unless you're in bright sunlight and even then it's hard to see things and getting proper focus can be a bit of a nightmare um, the trick with 3d photography is you have to think not in terms of two-dimensional composition but in terms of three-dimensional depth and this takes a bit of rewiring of your brain to figure out okay, well, I'm following a line, not across the frame, but into the frame physically as the depth changes. And, and a 3D image could have a lot of clutter in the background. So long as it's far away, it's actually going to fade away into nothingness and it's not going to distract you one bit. So uh, I found these lenses and started to explore and experiment with it. And I've been doing that for about two years now. Um, and I have found the insides of flowers, uh, freezing soap bubbles, all sorts of different subjects. Uh, tend to be uh, just like breathtaking and have such a wow factor. I typically uh, view them in 3D by crossing my eyes. Not everybody can do that. I but... couldn't. You said to do that on your website and I tried. <laughs> so I grabbed these out and I said, okay, I'm going to check it out. And it, like I said, it was an experience that everybody must do i mean they've got you, to come to your website try. i mean crossing your eyes doesn't require any equipment and about 50 percent <laughs> of the population can get it sometimes with a little bit of practice and if you can't get it don't worry you're not you're you're not broken in any way it, it's just your brain might not be wired to see that mm -hmm. um so 
I, I, I like to look at the back of my camera and I can cross my eyes and I can see it in 3D because when the image is recorded, um, a lens refracts uh, and refraction will flip something. So the image on the back of the uh, the LCD is actually uh, a, the, the, the inverted position. Uh, the left frame is on the right side, the right frame is on the left side, which is how you cross your eyes to see it in 3D. So I'm sure I look like a dork, but I'll often have just live view on and I'm looking at the back of the screen with my eyes crossed. Uh, and it's just like, wow, oh, this is so cool. I can see this kind of depth and um, yeah. Uh, and I didn't get you, I was showing your website so I didn't get your, I saw that you had crossed your eyes, Don. <laughs> I can do it again if you really want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the idea is, Love it. Uh, the, the idea is to push limits into new areas of photography and yes. always consider yourself on on the road to whatever the next project is going to be I never really rest on your laurels and uh, just take every big win as uh, as a foundation for what you're going to build on top of it yeah the 3d photography i've got a feeling i've pre-ordered a new uh, smartphone from red uh, red cameras of course they make some very high-end cinema cameras they're mm -hmm. coming out with a smartphone that will have a glassless 3d 5.7 inch uh, phone screen. So that's the size of an iPhone uh, Plus um, that you can show to anybody and see these images in 3D without glasses or any special trickery of any kind. Now, um, if that can be ubiquitous, if every phone could have that or every screen could just display 3D content uh, without glasses, then I think that this very, very small niche of photography and cinema uh, is going to explode because it's everywhere and people will be starved for content. So maybe I'm positioning myself to uh, to, to be a, a, a very good success within that, but I don't think it's commercially viable at all right now. <laughs> I'm doing it because I love it. Exactly. That's just so cool. So I want to let you know, Kim Norby's here, Bryce is here, Jan A is here. Um, Bryce is a huge fan. He's the one that I was, so Bryce, I just wanted to let you know that I was talking to Don about you. I said, uh, this is the person that was really into your, um, your, your, I mean, what, of course, everybody loves all of your snowflakes. I mean, but I mean, the thing that gets me is that I love everything that you do because you love to see things that we don't see with our eyes. Most macro photographers like us are feel the same way, but you take it even beyond, which is so cool. And but Bryce had said how much he really enjoys your snowflakes. I'm going to show the snowflakes with everybody as we're chatting. Uh, that is a big, huge. I mean, that's, it's, you've got an amazing book. So I actually told him about your book because we will go to your book right now. Oh, wait, where do I have your book? Oh, I got to find your book. Okay, I had your book. Here it is, Sky Crystals. So I was just, uh, you know, throwing out some information to Bryce, letting him know that you have this awesome book that tells everybody. Exact. That's what I love about you too, Don, is that you give everybody detailed information on how you do the stuff that you do. I mean, I see pictures. Well, I nothing back. I, I love to share all of my techniques because if more people are doing the same thing that I'm doing, then it just widens the audience for that kind of work. And I'm not worried of people creating the exact same thing as I'm creating. Because in a landscape photography scenario, maybe if you give away all of your secrets, somebody could replicate exactly the same shot. In the macro world, everything that you take pretty much is unique. Every if, if somebody replicated the exact same process for photographing snowflakes, because I gave them every single trick and tip and technique that I use from in camera and settings and equipment all the way through the post processing workflow, if they make an image in that same style, great. I, it's not going to be any of my snowflakes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to hurt my brand at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, it's hard to do. So even if you're given all of the, the tricks, not everybody is going to be able to, to do it. It's not a knock to other photographers. It's just I've spent over 10,000 hours dealing with snowflakes alone um, in terms of a macro subject. Every winter, um, at least initially, I started posting one new snowflake photograph every single day for 100 days starting on December 1st. And I built a brand around that to some degree. Yes. Um, now... Every image, by the way, takes about four hours to edit. 
uh, plus the shooting time and writing about it and social media interaction, that alone became a full-time job. The last two years, I've been doing it every day until Christmas, then every other day afterwards because I have a daughter now and uh, uh, that takes up a lot of time. Happy yeah. to have that time taken up, but yes. it just there's less time to work on the snowflakes. Yes. The one that I edited and posted today, I started working on this morning at 8 a.m., and I finished it at around 5 or 6 o'clock today. Um, um. And it was a gargantuan effort in order to make that happen. So is it a labor of love? Well, to some degree, yes. But, you know, I've been featured in documentary films for this sort of work. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been featured in a, an episode of BBC uh, Forces of Nature. Um, that was a whole series that they did, and I shot the title card for that. CBC's um, The Nature of Things and uh, an upcoming documentary from National Geographic called One Strange Rock. Uh, will feature a lot of my snowflake work as well. So if you can define yourself in a niche and be like the best person to do it, then we're a global village. Somebody's going to come in from somewhere in the world uh, and they're going to say, you are the best photographer at this obscure thing. We <laughs> need you. Uh, and you'd be surprised at how often that happens. No, that's great that you say that. I actually, um, in my membership, that we are working on portfolio and I made them sit because I was featured in um, popular photography for my macro lens po um, paintings and I had told them look you got to we love to photograph everything and that's all cool and you got you know go for it but really I'm making them like focus and say look what do you want to do put it down we're going to work on it and you're going to work hard because that's I mean, I have to say, though, I mean, when I I look at your your it's so intense. Anybody that does macro photography and, and seeing this is just incredible how beautiful and how much work you do. Let's talk a little bit about your post processing, not just with this, Don. I just kind of was curious on your thought process on post processing. I mean, where do you go with it? I know you're a Photoshop guy on one. I'm an on one girl. On One just came out with a new update, which I'm excited about, but um, I still keep learning, you know, I still keep the tools of Lightroom and Photoshop because that's the majority of people that I teach, but um, I'm curious to, to hear about you and your thought process as you're post-processing and working on these beautiful pieces. I mean, it's, it's incredible. You have to, you know, let me know. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, the, the magic has to happen in camera. Um, mm -hmm. The post-processing simply enhances it and helps you defy physics in some ways because uh, there's only so much that you can ever get in focus in a single macro photograph. And if you try to get more and more, more in focus, then diffraction is going to come in um, and start blurring things where the pixels or the, the light that should be hitting one pixel is bending uh, through the tiny, tiny little aperture and it's bending off course a little bit and it might hit the pixel next to the one that it should be hitting. And if that happens too much, that'll drastically reduce the resolution that you have to deal with. So to overcome that, a lot of my macro images are focus stacked where I have the camera on continuous shooting, typically as fast as my flash or whatever my light source can keep up with. And, uh, and I pass the camera physically, I move the camera through the focus ever so slightly. If it's a snowflake, the camera has to move like a couple of millimeters. It's not a big motion. Mm -hmm. um, you have to just move through whatever the thickness of the subject is um, and just shoot your heart out. Just shoot far more images than you think you need so that you can get whatever puzzle pieces you need into the post-processing workflow. In post-processing, and I love On One as well, by the way, and I'm taking a very keen look at their raw processor. Um, I was actually talking with them earlier today because I'm curious who is going to have support for a camera that I'm testing right now. Um, I've gotten my hands on the, the Panasonic um, GX9, which is a tiny little compact camera with, um, I'm, I'm testing their uh, 45 millimeter Leica macro lens. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful. And I've gotten great, great results with this. But I can't process the raw files because the camera, I don't think it, it's, it's announced, but I don't know if it's shipping yet. So I can't, <laughs> I can't edit the raw images. Oh, that's frustrating. And this is crazy. So I was talking to On One saying, guys, you got to get on, uh, you know, on the ball with, with this and beat Adobe to raw support for this camera. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. They have some preliminary support in there that I'm going to check out at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, but 
the the issue with me is you can't push things to be perfect in post processing if you don't have the necessary building blocks in camera. And so the whole process starts with constructing an image or controlling the scene uh, in in cameras uh, or in in studio. A lot of my images uh, I replace the background on uh, in camera. Like I'll put a flower in the background, and if I'm mm -hmm. doing water droplet, that jumps into the water droplets themselves. Um, controlling lighting helps you get the most out of the image in terms of uh, you know shadows and contours and background illumination and removing distractions. When I'm doing extensive post-processing, uh, it's mostly fixing issues that come up with focus stacking because no two images are going to align perfectly. The average snowflake is a combination of 40 or so. The most I've done is 70. Uh, the one I did today was 62, so that's why it took so long. But I go in and I, I, I go in and I fix every flaw, like making it as pixel perfect as possible. Now. That difference, you know, you might spend an hour on the image and you get yourself 95% there. The extra 5% comes with many extra hours of work. And who's going to notice? Most of the people wouldn't. I don't think a lot of people care about this as much as I do. Um, but there is just a... There, there is, uh, there's a lot of fun uh, bits and pieces in post processing that I continue to pick up. Um, like uh, one of the things that I've been using in the last little while, just to, and it's very helpful for macro photography, is I'll edit my image to the point where it's looking really good, but then I will take a version of that and run it through uh, Nick software, uh, Silver Effects Pro, and uh, the structural contours within that program are much better than any. Uh, clarity or dehaze uh, functionality that you find in the Adobe software. Uh, and there might be comparable stuff from on one, um, but the Nick software is available for free for a lot of people. That creates a black and white image. But here's the trick. You bring that into Photoshop as a layer on top of the original color image, and you change its blending mode from normal to luminosity. And so it will just take the brightness and darkness of that layer it will take the color information from the layer underneath it. So you'll get all of that, the higher texture and contour and structure of the, uh, the Nick software processed image applied to the color information. And sometimes it can be a bit much in certain areas, and that's where the Photoshop knowledge with layer masks come in. Create a layer mask. I'll typically invert the layer mask so that it starts black. Mm -hmm. And then I will paint in where I want that effect to come in stronger. And in doing so, what I'll typically do is not use the brush tool because I don't want it to be like at its maximum point. I want it to kind of grow um, in um, in an or I guess what what would it be like a uh, like a, a curve where the more you apply, the less effect you see. And that's easily done by using the dodge tool, dodging the shadows. Oh, so gotcha. If you dodge the yes. shadows, yes, yes, then yes. If you go over that same area again, it's no longer as deeply in the shadows, and it, it applies the effect less and less and less. So it lets you really smooth out and find a nice contour with uh, bringing in this little bit of extra texture and structure to an image. This is part of the fine tuned process that I deal with with just about every photograph that I go through. Uh, there's you know, 20, 50 different little steps that I might do, but that's a key one that I found very useful and started doing about a year ago. See everyone, get Nick, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's great. I really, uh, I, I like knowing your brain thought process and how you're looking at things because I also use a variety of masks and all that stuff. I mean, really to tell you the truth is it's all about our creations. Yes, I, always, I agree that you have to get what it, you know, the good exposures, everything in sharp, bring it in and then uh, mess with it afterwards. But um it's good to know everyone has their different ways of creating the end results. And like you say too, you've done a lot of work to play and learn and make mistakes. That's a big thing. You gotta make mistakes to learn. 
Uh, that's that's huge. I, I wouldn't even call them really mistakes. They're it's just educational. It, it, it is a part of the process. Yes. It is a requirement in order to get the shot that you're after. And so that is not a mistake. That's yes. a necessary component. It is. And, and I'm so glad that we're talking about that because, it, you know, when we're chatting on our own and really working things out i i always feel bad when they get people get so hard on themselves it's okay it's okay please don't get hard on yourself just keep going and keep working it and do what you love to do and the passion that you have um if it wasn't a macro show i'd be showing a lot of infrared and a whole bunch of other stuff but <laughs> but we it is a macro close-up show i want one of the things that bothers me a lot and uh -huh. i'm not bothered by much is the near misses like if i'm trying to photograph a bee in flight and i know how technically challenging it can be and i've got the the gear i've got the technique but then it does also come down to luck to some degree when you've got moving elements in nature, when you're trying to capture life, life is not a static thing. Um, and so when you get that bee that's in the perfect position, zooming around the flower, <laughs> and he is like a millimeter out of focus, so that means he's completely out of focus, and you you missed it. But you can see how perfect it would have been if you just had that one lottery number <laughs> in your favor. You'd be the millionaire, but you didn't, and you've got nothing. <laughs> I hear you on that. And I know there's a lot of people out there too. And you're like with the with your camera and your lens, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh yeah, I've been actually looking forward to it again. I mean, uh, right here, we're, we're looking at a snowstorm coming in that's just going to cover us with another foot or two of snow overnight. And uh, I mean, I, I shoot snowflakes. I mean, I can use it. I can make good on that. <laughs> but I'm kind of tired of it now. I want the flowers to start blooming. I can see the irises and the crocuses starting to poke up. And I, so I want to get back to that that level of life. Yes, I know. I hear you. Um, I, you're on the kind of the eastern side of Canada. My husband, my husband's from Boston. So we lived in Massachusetts for a while. So I understand. Uh, unfortunately, in California we are having a heat spell we just barely had snow i live actually in the foothills in the mountains and we just barely got snow this week and you're going to get our storm that's coming over to you but i i feel for you my my brother-in-law my family you know my whole my husband's family is just they've been blasted and i understand and i'm actually showing oh no i'm not showing it now but i was just showing the beautiful uh it looks like a daisy gerber daisy with an ice um it was it's an ice bubble is that how it's a, it's a freezing soap bubble yeah soap yeah. bubble yes oh my gosh we will share that again because that is just and, like and th those images are really fun to create they're not as difficult as you might think um you know to create a freezing soap bubble you just need cold temperatures i think 14 fahrenheit uh, or colder would probably be that ideal window and just very very calm air um if you blow a soap bubble uh, with a, a mixture that includes white corn syrup to thicken it up so that it won't pop. Uh, six parts water, two parts just regular dish soap, and one part white corn syrup. Blow it through a drinking straw, and then you can just carefully place it down on the snow wherever you want. I've done that a number of times. I mm. love doing that. It's a lot of fun, but it does kind of get old after a little while. So I got to think, well, okay, replace the snow with something else. Try to you know, put it on a Christmas tree branch, or how about a flower? And I tried a number of different flowers, including roses and all sorts of stuff. But this Gerbera daisy just turned out to be the best. You've got yeah. to leave the flower outside so that it can acclimate to the outside temperature. And it doesn't have its own heat source. Otherwise, the bubble's not going to melt on it. So you leave it outside for a half an hour. Uh, there's one light that is shining from behind being backlit. And that's to light up the, uh, the, the freezing bubble itself and illuminate all those little frost crystals. And then one that is aimed sort of underneath the flower just to get a bit of light filling in the foreground, uh, but in a, um, not really a backlit, but sort of like a glowing kind of way that it looks like the flower is its own light source hitting the snow underneath it. Uh, that took a day. That, that photograph took, you know, a trip to the flower store, buying things that I would think would be interesting, mm -hmm. waiting for the right conditions to come out, trying, experimenting for hours in the cold, uh, and finally getting this as a result. It did not come with the, the first initial idea and snapping a photograph and saying, hey, we're done. Um, yeah. There was a road to walk to get to that. Yeah, no, no, it's beautiful. And I'm also seeing one 
that you did on a pine. It looks like it's a pine tree or Branch part. Pine Christmas tree, yes, which yes. I missed them to pick up um, because the uh, the garbage people will pick up Christmas trees for a couple of weeks in uh, in January, and I missed that. So I had my Christmas tree still in my garage, uh, just kind of falling apart and uh, and drying out. So I just hey, you know what? Let's snap a branch off of that and stick that out and use that as a prop. There you go. And it looks gorgeous. Everybody's beautiful. seeing how beautiful it is. Yeah, they're chatting over on, um, I, I don't see Facebook. I, sometimes it, that gets disconnected, but YouTube's always ha is very happy. Uh, they're chatting about what you're doing in your bubbles. And um, we have a couple other people that I know that just love macro photography that are diving in and chatting over there. So thanks, you guys, for hanging out with us. I want to go ahead and share um, your, let me go to, we're going to go to my equipment logo, and then we're going to talk about some of your equipment, okay? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> I do that because I want everybody to know when you have a podcast, it's good to have like little breaks, <laughs> even though I don't have my podcast yet, it will come. So, uh, yeah, I, I have a little thing that I've worked so hard for doing the back end and it's, it's a challenge to have shows and podcasts and all that stuff, but it's coming along. It is a new show. So, and I, and I'm, I was telling Don that I'm super excited that there's been a lot of positive feedback on the photographers that want to come in. And I'm really excited that you guys have all had said hello and yes, I will come on. And it is, you know, my following is not huge like a lot of other people, but it's a brand new show. So, I think us macro photographers are going to rock this and it's going to keep going. So Dawn, tell me, tell me, or show us some of the favorite. Uh, uh, I always say to everybody, I'm sure you're the same way. The equipment is not what makes the photograph, but it's good to have equipment to get where you want to be. So Dawn's going to share some of his favorites of where, what he uses to get where he wants to be. There, there are two primary things that you need to think about in terms of macro photography uh, when you're looking at gear. One of them is magnification, and the other one is light source. So for magnification, a lot of the work that I do goes beyond that one-to-one -one macro uh, moniker. And I'm glad that you actually delineated close-up macro and micro at the beginning because there is a difference between that, although collectively we think of it all as macro photography. I know. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, my favorite lens is the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens. And uh, the reason for this is it starts at one to one and it will extend itself out to five to one magnification within a single lens. Uh, and that is very versatile and flexible when I'm photographing subjects on the fly if I'm out in the garden and I've got different sized bugs I wanna photograph or different sized flowers um, or also snowflakes. So this lens was incredibly useful for me and it's one of the reasons why I was shooting Canon for the longest time. However, there is a new lens uh, just announced yesterday, I think, from Laowa. Uh, it's a 25 millimeter, 2.5 to 5x macro lens um, that's available on Nikon and Pentax and Sony and Canon and everybody else um, that would be a contender for this. Really? Uh, I haven't not, heard of it. If, if you're not a Canon shooter. Yeah, just recently announced. I think it'll have a five or $600 price tag. So not that expensive either in terms of the cost of a new lens. The challenge for that, though, is it will have a manual aperture which means you've got to set that in and that aperture will be closed down to whatever setting you put it at mm -hmm. while you're looking through the viewfinder so if you have an optical viewfinder it's going to get noticeably dimmer than a lens like this mm -hmm. if you can live with that if you're in a studio setup or if you have an electronic viewfinder it might be more useful for you um, but those kinds of high magnification lenses end up being something fun and uh, and challenging to play with and they can get old too. Like I've got this one here. Uh, this is okay. a bellows lens. Oh yeah, uh, bellows! I love bellows. So this is a Canon 20 millimeter f 3.5, I think. Yeah, 3.5 from 1978, oh. and uh, this gets to about a 10 to one magnification. Oh now, wow! Now optics aren't fantastic, but at 10 to one, you're not going to get fantastic optics for nearly this cheap. This cost me about $200, I think. Uh, for the lens and the bellows, uh, the prices will 
ebb and flow on eBay depending on availability. When I looked, they were flooded with them, so there was a pretty cheap price on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just adapt the Canon FD mount to whatever camera mount you want uh, and then stick this on and run with it. So you can do this cheap. Magnification is something that can be had without spending a lot of money. Yeah. And you can go back a few decades and get that gear because macro photography in general uh, we don't have to worry about autofocus. At least I don't. I mean, I'm always. I don't know how you can't. The camera. You know, you uh, really can't. <laughs> and image stabilization is only going to take you so far. It's not going to make a good photograph, especially if you're controlling the image with good light. Uh, and I use a number of different light sources. Actually, I've got um, for the freezing soap bubbles we were talking about. I've got yep. some giant flashlights. Oh, that's um, cool. What is that oh, called? Yeah. Of course it's cool. It's <laughs> massive. I could kill somebody with this thing. Just <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it's uh, Night Core, uh, N I T E uh, uh, Core, makes uh, a bunch of really high powered LED flashlights. Some of them in their tiny monster series, they actually have tripod mounts on the bottom. So I just put a little spacer in there so that it fits mm. my mounts properly. But I, I don't know why every flashlight doesn't have this, but a tripod mount on the bottom of a flashlight is a genius idea. It is. Be because I can use tabletop tripods, like the little Manfrotto pixie tripods. Or yeah, something I have mine around here too, and, I love uh, it. Or just put this on any, uh, like I, when I'm doing the outdoor stuff, I'll put this on a big tripod and just stick it out somewhere. Okay. Continuous God. light is, is a great option for subjects where you need the light to be on the subject to frame and compose things properly. And uh, oftentimes I say the brighter the better, typically if it's from a single light source when I'm dealing with the freezing soap bubbles because I refocus that down. And if you refocus an array of LEDs, you see all of the array of LEDs and it doesn't work out so well. Well, that's what I was going to ask you because LED usually has like a whole bunch of um, lights inside. So that doesn't have that? It, it ha this one has a single diode and it's 1800 lumens. Wow, uh, that is, is so cool. It's also $400. So But you know, uh, but if you're going to do that, it's okay. It's okay if that if that's what your goal is because when you get in close and you have all that little messed up lighting, it's frustrating. So if you're going to get close is. Is. and you want now, to get uh, it when I'm dealing with my snowflakes and a lot of my in the field macro work, I'll typically be using um, a ring flash. And so yes. uh, this is the uh, the Canon MR14 EX2. I love um, that. But uh, I'll be honest with you. If you're a Canon shooter, uh, the Yongnuo YN-14 EX is an excellent clone to this one at a fifth the price, I think. Really? Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll have to share I, that. I've, I've got them both. And, and so the only reason why I'm using this one is because the newer version of the Canon flash has a custom function where if I double tap, half tap the shutter button, mm -hmm. it'll automatically turn on the focusing lamps uh, so that I can see the subject better. Yep, um, I love that. That was not a feature on the original version of the ring flash from Canon. Oh, I didn't know that. Young Nuo clone. So it doesn't have that feature. Um, but oh. the Young Nuo one at 100 bucks or less, man, go out and buy that. The only subjects that it doesn't work well for are water droplets and spherical surfaces, like the eyes of a spider or the shell of a ladybug yeah, cause it or a water droplet. Breaks it. You'll see the, you'll see the ring flash uh, in, in the subject, and it's very distracting. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realize is a ring flash doesn't have to be mounted to the front of the lens. You can unclip it, and you could hold it in every different angle. You could put it behind the subject if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as you take that that flash and start moving it around to different angles, you'll start to get some creative ideas. Yeah. And yeah, some of them won't work out perfectly, but it's all knowledge uh, that will build up towards the shot that you're trying to take. Um, now, one more piece of gear that I want to talk about here sure. uh, is something that is near and dear to my heart is a third hand tool and everybody listening to this should go out and buy one because they're like seven dollars on amazon um <laughs> these things have little posable alligator clamps um that can hold a subject like the stem of a flower or a leaf or whatever you want i typically take the magnifying glass component off it just kind of twists and it screws off, off yeah um, and then this has like a, a relatively solid base i because I give them away to all of my students. Uh, Janice, you probably have at least one of these from me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I ended up buying like a thousand of them directly from China because I was just giving them away to everybody. Uh, yeah, I so, do. Yeah. <laughs> and I, 
disposable because if I dunk these underwater to hold something underneath the surface of the water so that it can kind of come and break the surface of the uh, of the water, I get nice reflections, but everything is static. And this thing's going to rust to pieces. Uh, and yeah, maybe I'll throw it away because I got a bunch more. Right, but right. They're, they're cheap. They're incredibly useful. If you're trying to stage and position things, especially if you're doing tabletop macro, which a lot of my work is, um, seven dollars. I, I should probably start selling them myself. <laughs> you gotta uh, patent your own. Mark that up a little bit. But uh, <laughs> if you were to buy something like that in a camera store, I can guarantee you it will, ha will have a price tag of forty or fifty dollars. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, they jacked that up. You know, they they're used for soldering and jewelry and all sorts of different things that uh, you know you can get them for cheap and they work amazing. It's a wonderful tool to have. Well, thank you so much. I know that a lot of people are probably like, oh my gosh, I got to check that out and hold things because that's partially some of the problems when you're setting up is like, how do you want it positioned and it falls and all that fun stuff. So that's a great piece of tools that we can all use. I actually have one and I love it. Um, it it definitely is when you get in really close. Now, I want that lens that you have that goes to the, the Canon lens that goes to the five times. Mm -hmm. uh, my dog is roaming around. I don't know if you can hear her. <laughs> she's like, this is live, everyone. Uh, she's like ready to go after my neighbors or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, is, there, is that... Are you good with your equipment? Because I really want to start like talking to you because we only have, it's 5.52. I'm keeping on the clock. I will not let you go over, Don. I know you've I, got... I will say one more piece of gear. That, sure. As I mentioned earlier, I've been really liking this Panasonic, um, uh, the, the Leica 45 millimeter macro lens because on a smaller camera sensor, if you're not trying to go to extreme magnifications, uh, like 5, 10, I've shot up to 20 times magnification. Yeah. Then... The one-to-one -one on a micro four-thirds camera, which this lens gets to, is the uh, the equivalent of two-to-one magnification on my full-frame camera sensor. And that makes this in the range of shooting water droplet refractions without needing extension tubes or any more exotic lenses, mm -hmm. uh, all in one package. And so um, if you are a shooter with a smaller camera like this, there's a lot of great options. Olympus has a 60 millimeter lens. The, the, the Leica 45 is great. Uh, and of course you can adapt just about any lens to any camera these days, especially yes. if there's some level of manual control, um, then the older lenses, if you go on eBay and you don't have a macro lens or you just want to experiment with something or put it in harm's way, like I, I want to kind of like half dunk a lens underwater. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that would be cool. <laughs> it would be really cool. And I'm going to buy like a $50 old broken macro lens off of eBay and use that as sort of the cost of doing business for that. So there's lots of options in equipment. <laughs> and I'm excited to see when you do that because I know eventually you will. <laughs> and it'll be fun. <laughs> That's very cool. Oh, good. That's good to know, too. We'll definitely add that in the show notes too, so people can check it out. And then if you have any, we will, uh, one thing that I, if you have anything on your YouTubes, actually, I, I you know what? I got to really quickly go to your photo geek. Okay. So let me go sure. over to, I really, because we, Don has a meeting. I want to make sure that you guys know this is a great, let me get over to my, let's see right here, here. It's called photo geek. He has just started a podcast. It's very cool. Uh, it's great with technology. And I, I mean, I'm not as smart as you, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> good, good, good. And it's, by the way, it's Photo Geek Weekly. Oh, yes. Photo can, Geek Weekly. Yes. And you can find that at photogeekweekly.com or just type that into iTunes or uh, wherever you find your podcasts. And, uh, and we talk about uh, the techie geeky side of photography, but we boil it down to something that is meaningful and useful to just about everybody. So we'll take a complex topic and uh, and find kind of the, the the meaningful points about it that we should all care about moving forward. Sometimes it's technology that doesn't exist yet in terms of you know what's coming around the corner. Uh, other times it's just released new stuff or. Um, how photographers should interact with their images and, and society and the world uh, from a kind of a psychological level, color science, and all of that comes into play. Uh, and we aim for about an hour-long broadcast every week. The episode uh, 16 was just released today. Yay! Uh, and uh, so very happy about that. Yep. It's, uh, 
it, it, it is a growing thing, and I am so thrilled by the number of people that have tuned in and continue to subscribe. And uh, I didn't think I would have this much fun doing it. It is a blast. It's time consuming, sure, but it's so much fun. Yeah, that's exactly why I do this. <clears throat> because it's, it is time consuming. You got to set it up. You got to get things going. But it's so much fun. I really do enjoy talking to you, other macro photographers, sharing about macro stuff. What are you guys doing? How, what's your, how do you get your motivation? What, you know, I'm looking, everybody's looking right now at your podcast. Please, I will send the link down below. You guys got to check out his podcast. I've been totally enjoying that. I saw Martin in there. That was very cool. Is he on the show a lot with you? I saw Martin uh, Bailey. Martin Bailey we had once and we're talking. He's uh, He's got some tours and some trips around and he's going to be coming back on, I think, in the March time frame. Oh, great. Um, and uh, the, the next nice guest guy. we're going to have on is uh, Darlene Hildebrandt. And oh. uh, so she is going to be uh, a very welcome voice and uh, the voice of reason in many ways. Uh, to balance things out. Uh, but I don't even know what we're going to talk about yet because it's all the <laughs> stuff that's going to happen between now and, and the next week that we record. Right, right. Yep. No, that's great. It's really, it's really good. I signed, I just signed up for it. I will be listening. I'll be one of your fans here. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, no, it's great. And we will definitely share that and get people to chime in. I love you know what you're doing and talking about the technical stuff too i like what you say photo geek weekly and it's hard to put a week <clears throat> what you're doing to get a week every single week podcast i do this show every other week <laughs> i can't it's a lot of I work don't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work so um with with that said <clears throat> i just want to thank you so much it's 5.57. I want to thank you so much, Don, for hanging out with me, talking about your work, sharing your tools, everything that you do. You're such a nice guy, and I really do appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for and, having me. And, uh, and, and I will say that if anybody was listening or watching uh, this and you want to get in touch, please do. I'm always open to a conversation. During the snowflake season, I might be slower to respond, uh, but I always respond to everybody and I enjoy talking about this stuff. It's in my blood. So if you've got any questions or you want to strike up a conversation, by all means, send me an email. You can get all my contact information at uh, doncom.ca. That's D-O-N-K-O-M dot C-A. And if you want to learn about snowflakes and how to photograph and that stuff is translatable to a lot of other small macro subjects, then I've got a dedicated website for that stuff and that is skycrystals.ca and uh, the book covers all the science of snowflakes but also every single bit of technique and uh, and equipment that you would need to replicate the process and adapt it to your own tastes so you can check that out as well and um, I guess that's it for me uh, yeah. again thank you so much Janice for having me on it's been a great chat no it has it has it's really good I'm actually going to put your links down below so people watching the after show can go check out your book which is amazing check out your podcast check out your website all that fun stuff and everybody I just want to let you know real quick that our next will be two weeks from now so when is that I don't even know March something I had it in my show notes but I just Totally enjoy talking with Don that I don't even know. Two it's weeks. On a Thursday, it'll be March 15th. <laughs> March 15th will be the next Macro Photography Chat Live show. It's at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hope to see you there. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Don, hold on one second because I just want to sure chat. Let me just, I'll yep. let you know when we're done.